The text for today's sermon comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 7. I'll begin reading in chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together with him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that at that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. This is God's word. Thank you. Thank you for coming out and for participating in worship, and thank you to the worship team for encouraging us through song and hymn and spiritual song today, and to all our groups who labor to encourage the hearts of the saints, and I thank you in the name of Jesus. The, those, the uh, hymn, He is Coming Again, uh, that certainly isn't new. But it, it, is, it, is, uh, it reminds us of uh, the return of our Lord. A delightful song, he is coming again, he is coming again. And this, that will be on my mind throughout the week for sure. We thank the Lord for the text before us today. This text, Chapter 2, verses 3 through 7 is the specific text that we'll be looking at. It's part of a larger uh, section. Chapter 2, <coughs> verses uh, 1 through 12, uh, appertaining to the defense of the church by Paul against a, uh, a faction uh, desiring to dissuade them of uh, certain truths regarding the second coming of our Lord. The <clears throat> At the same time, you'll notice in our text 3 through 7 where Paul picks up on a, on a character known as the man of lawlessness. The man of lawlessness. What Paul is doing is he is reminding the church at Thessalonica of the truths that he has already taught them and it's regarding the second coming of Christ, and in particular, this man of lawlessness who must arise in the time of rebellion before our Lord's appearing. He wants to put them right, but he also wants to instruct again on something that is of vital 
uh, importance. It's something for the church to know. He's reminding them. Second, uh, Second Thess, chapter 2, verse 5, Paul says, Do you not remember when I was still with you, I told you these things? So it's not something new, it's something important. Second Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 15, Paul writes, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. So Paul wants the church to know certain things about the second coming. And he wants, by the Holy Spirit, this is what God wants for us as well. So today we're going to pick up against the backdrop of defending the church against uh, error regarding the second coming. We want to pull out this picture, bring it to the foreground, bubble it out just a wee bit, and look at the person, this man of lawlessness and the rebellion and its significance uh, to us today. So this is where we're going. The question will relate to the identity of the man of lawlessness and then we will apply this understanding to our lives today and I trust carefully. One thing that needs to be said is that in spite of all of the confusion, a sound understanding of who this man of lawlessness is, uh, is simply not present in much of the evangelical world. We have plenty of misunderstanding, but not much solid ground regarding this character known as the man of lawlessness. So we're going to look at that today and then apply it to our lives. So let's pray and then we will dig in. Heavenly Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus, we come together today. Help me, Lord, as a weak man seeking to serve you, albeit uh, in, a, in a fallen state, yet converted, battling in this, in this era we know as, as uh, uh, the moment of sanctification. Lord, help me, help us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. In particular, help me to say things um, that honor you and straighten out the crooked and, and, and block the ears uh, from error. So Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Help me today to get this message across to us all. Indeed, Lord, may we take that which we receive and apply it well to your honor and glory, and we pray it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So within the visible church in the West, there is much confusion over the last things, as we have said earlier. The situation is fed by popular and often unbiblical views of the second coming, even the last days. It also, and also, there is pressure from the secular culture, which encourages professing believers to view the last days and the associated teachings as some kind of myth, something that we just want to read and then put to one side and get on with life. The secular world wants the faithful to think that believing in Christ's return is somehow irrational. And we just want to think about it uh, at times when, uh, when we're, we're more lightheaded, when we just want to think fancifully. Well, that needs to be rejected we must come back to the understandings of the second coming and the events surrounding it through the text and apply it carefully to our lives, indeed to our understanding. And we're going to have that as one of our objectives today. So we're going to reinforce one truth that is often not received well by the visible church in the West, and that's the teaching of the man of lawlessness. To this end, we're going to seek uh, answers to these questions. Who is the man of lawlessness anyway, and how might this truth apply? Who is this man of lawlessness, and how might this truth apply? 
Understanding the man of lawlessness should give us a better picture as to what might be coming. And understanding the man of lawlessness will also help us to understand what's going on right now. Uh, when John spoke concerning Moses and Jesus, he was presenting very accurately the whole understanding of type antitype that we've been talking about on Sunday nights. Moses does not, although he approximates Christ, as John pointed out, he, he uh, falls short, the final version of, uh, that is, of Jesus Christ himself uh, surpassed what uh, Moses uh, did and uh, demonstrated. Jesus came voluntarily and suffered, died, and rose again. Think about typology in another way. You have the many versions of Antichrist. You have the fallen ones in our culture today, a type of Antichrist. We see types here and there, but the final version is going to be a particular individual, and uh, there will be things about this one that cannot be, that we don't get yet, cannot be grasped at this moment. Type, antitype. So let's turn our attention to the first question. Who is the man of lawlessness? Final version, Antichrist. So here we go. The man of lawless, lawlessness is described in this text as being a rebel, or we could say rebellious. The man of lawlessness is described here as rebellious. And we're going to look at that word carefully. Verse 3, let no one deceive you in any way. Understand this, that in these days, and let me just back up a little bit and describe what seems to be going on in our day. Those of you who are students of philosophy and history know that there was a chap, his name in the 19th century, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. Now, you remember Nietzsche. He's the guy who uh, argued for many things, a very dark philosopher. But he was uh, a man of much gloom. And he announced that God was dead. And the humanists of his day picked up the mantle and, and, and declared, oh, joyous day, now we don't have to obey the law of that God of the Christians. We don't have to be uh, oppressed by his law. Now we are truly free. And so this, this version of optimism erupted on the scene and, uh, and everyone was uh, happy uh, for a season. But then reality kicked in. Because if your God is man, then, thing, then the party soon turns sour. Well, then along came uh, some companions, that is to say, Karl Marx and Charles Darwin and everything. And, and then there, there, there was this, this idea, well, maybe we can, maybe we can trust in, in, in politics and government and science, and that will give us some significance. And no, that didn't help. And so an age of despair came. And, um, and then folks said to themselves, let us turn to mood-altering chemicals and other things, other institutions, and maybe uh, uh, entertainment for our God. And that didn't work and still isn't. So you have this admixture of unusual uh, sort of a... a, a, a an, uh, uh, an unsubstantiated optimism and much despair afoot today. It is into this that we speak as a church. And this is the, this is the kind of rebellion that, that Paul is speaking. And we said, let no one deceive you in any way. In this kind of culture, deception is great. And we're going to talk about that more next week. Deception is great. And so... As in the Greco-Roman world, Paul writing there and through the Holy Spirit speaking to us today from the very word that was inspired back in A.D. 60s. What, what the word is saying is that look out because in cultures like ours, deception is great and real. 
and it will assault you every single day. So let no one deceive you in any way, Paul says, for that day. What day? The day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That day will not come, he says. Now remember the uh, the church of Thessalonia was being deceived by people who were saying, the Lord has already come. And they were confused. Okay, what about us? What about uh, the loved ones who've gone on before? What's going to happen to them? So Paul is saying, don't listen to them. They're liars. Certain things have to happen. And here's one of them. Unless the rebellion comes first, and then the Greek text continues, and you don't take rebellion and the next person identified, the next identification apart, they must be held together. So listen to this. For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. We'll we'll pause there for a moment. Okay, uh, Paul is saying rebellion must come first. What is that? Rebellion is a world that is a word that is best understood as opposition to God, rather like we've already been discussing. This is opposition to God. God cannot be our solution. We're going to try other things like ourselves, government, uh, entertainment, money, human sexuality. We're going to try all that, and it leads nowhere but to despair, but the desire is to keep going. That is rebellion, one aspect of it. It is opposition to God, and it comes from within the people of God and outside of the people of God, so it has a rather large scope. We think of false professors in the church as as a part of this rebellion. Recently, the Methodist Church had a a, a very important vote in the ordination of homosexuals, and it was something like, what was it, Pastor Joel, 52% to 48% in favor of the traditional view, holding to the biblical view, I should say, and, and not to ordain. The uh, interesting thing, it was the delegates from Africa who turned the tide. It was the delegates from Africa, not here, so swamped by false professors. And by the way, when, after the vote was taken, the room burst into an uproar. That's the kind of rebellion. The the people were strongly opposed to the vote. We can't have that. Well, it's a vote. Why not just join in unity? See, to people who think like the world, unity only matters when we're all thinking like them. But it doesn't matter if they lose the vote. So there you have it, hot from the press. False professors in the church and from the secular world, that is creature versus creator. That is this whole concept of Darwinism, this whole lie that somehow we have come up from the slime. And if we come from the slime, then what value do we have? Maybe it would be better if we changed it, at least if we, if we evolved from maybe pocket bunnies, lint. We might feel better about ourselves. At least there, there might be some, some, uh, uh, some extravagant lint in some pockets from which we might find our worth. But no, that doesn't work either. So when he talks about rebellion, what Paul is saying is that opposition to God, it's from inside and outside. And it's saying we don't want truth, we don't want God. So that's it. Then notice, unless the rebellion comes first, and this this is the, the, we have it now, but there's the final version. Think of type, anti-type. John talked about Moses and Christ. That's a positive side of it. Now look at the negative side of it. You have you have moments of rebellion like ours, but there's coming a rebellion that is final version. 
And it is associated with that that the man of lawlessness will come. Okay, so Paul, unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Hold on to that word because we're going to get there. Again. He, this man of lawlessness, is revealed in the sense that he is intimately associated with the rebellion and it would appear the leader of it. So he arises from the rebellion and is now over it. He is Antichrist. 1 John 2.18. If you'd go to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. Remembering type anti-type. Children, he says John, children, it is the last hour and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming. So this is the man of lawlessness, parallel term. Uh, notice that there is one coming, final version. So many Antichrists have come. So the final version is coming, but, but types are, have been around and uh, present now. Uh, that's what Paul is driving at. John is driving at that, and Paul brings that in here. So unless the rebellion comes first, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man of lawlessness, final version, but there are also folks around who were also lawless, and perhaps Paul had them in mind. The very personification of, of evil. This man of lawlessness acts as if there is no law of God. And that's why people in the modern era can vote for a law that murders babies even outside of the womb whilst affirming the protection of animals. These people, the, this is living as if there is no Law of God. That's what's going on. That's what he's talking about. Lawlessness and rebellion. The words go together. Doesn't that sound familiar? I'm not saying final version. I don't know. That's up to God. But it stinks. And where is the church en masse declaring truth? I talked with an attorney who was down at the Capitol this week again defending the cause for the church against this crazy law uh, coming to, to a vote um, and uh, regarding counseling in the church and how uh, reparative therapy cannot be used or other therapies. We cannot even speak of homosexuality as a sin, even in biblical counseling. And this attorney told me that um, yeah, the likelihood that it'll be defeated in the Senate, but he said liberalism keeps beating the drum. And the church has got to stop playing games and trust in Jesus and be willing to declare the truth, even if it means we lose attendees. We are not a business. We don't look for customers. We seek to glorify God and the benefit of many and encourage those who come, the body of Christ, but we do not want to appear to be winsome to the world. And we want to be winsome in a godly sense, but never in a worldly sense. Paul perhaps had people like Antiochus IV on his mind who in 170 BC desecrated the Jerusalem temple by setting up an altar to the pagan deity Zeus. Or perhaps he had General Roman General Pompey on his mind who in 63 BC entered the Holy of Holies and, and, and desecrated that holy site. 
or perhaps the crazy Emperor Caligula who made his horse a member of the Praetorian Guard. There's a guy to watch. Caligula in 40 AD considered himself to be God and tried to have his statue set up in the Jerusalem temple. Perhaps Paul had these events on his mind and even something else. How about Daniel? How about the book of Daniel, chapter 12? How about verses 10 and 11? Perhaps this is so. Paul may have been thinking about the time of the end in Daniel where it writes, Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, shall be 1290 days. Interesting, apocalyptic language. Uh, Larry and I will deal with this language in this, in, as we teach through the book of Revelation. But it is fascinating how the language in Daniel is, appears to be in the mind of Paul. It's just this evil and wicked, rebellious individual and the, the, the era of rebellion itself appears to be motivated by such, such scriptures as from Daniel 12, 10 through 11. So then, Paul uses the word son of destruction. And the Greek word, you know, those words, what it's saying really is this guy is going to be punished. That's how the Greek is used here. It's not concerning uh, the destruction he will cause, but that which will come upon him. He is a son of destruction. His ultimate condition is he will be judged. He will be ruined. So even as Paul describes this, this guy, there is indeed judgment coming because God is just and he is over all. So then the man of lawlessness is a man of rebellion. Note that the current hatred from the church should bring us to a pondering and prayer. It should bring us to pondering and prayer. It is not our objective to live a comfortable life. It is our objective to live a godly life which will draw fire in this kind of culture. Guaranteed. Secondly, who is this man of lawlessness? He is also proud. Look at verse 4. Who, this is the son of destruction, the man of lawlessness, who is intimately affiliated with the time of rebellion, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. Think of the words of Daniel on the mind of Paul, likely, as he enters into this verse, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So this lawless one, who he not only opposes God, but also every object of human worship, he exalts himself. He really wants to replace God and every other uh, religion. He thinks of himself so highly that he will not tolerate any rival of any sort. Whoa. When one thinks of the modern era, one is shocked. I remember when a former Marxist president of this country was elected and the school children sang his praises in school. My back tingled. I thought, how dare you? How dare you? Singing the praises of a man? Are you crazy? Daniel eleven thirty six. If that's for me, tell him I'm busy. And the king shall do as he wills. Daniel eleven thirty six. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god 
and shall speak astonishing things against the God of gods. Sound familiar? Paul influenced by what? Type, antitype? Paul, through the word of God, making strong statements about his present condition and looking to a final version so this final version will be proud. He will think of himself so highly he will not tolerate any rival of any sort. This perspective leads to the wicked act taking his seat in the temple and calling himself God. In brief, he is referring to the temple in Jerusalem. How is he referring to it? Big debate about this, many positions. It would appear that it is metaphorical. He is usurping the authority of God, likely thinking of Antiochus IV and others and saying, but this version, this version will take his seat in the sense even greater will be his abomination than that of Antiochus. The people would know about that. They would know about, they would know about um, uh, likely even about Pompeii would be in their mind. Certainly uh, Caligula. And they would think, oh yes, now we know. And yes, he will take his seat and will display his pride. So the man of lawlessness is a man of rebellion and pride. Believers must beware of leaders, particularly religious, who paint themselves in the role of God. Deny them. And then there's another. Verse 5, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? He's saying to the church, don't forget them. Don't be deceived by liars who will minimize the second coming of Christ, for certain things must happen, and here they are. And he gives it to them again, and churches around the nation must hear it again. And you know, verse 6, what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. Paul has likely taught about this in some detail. So we're walking into the middle of this, of this conversation in, as modern people into the ancient writing. But it is absolutely true. We don't know all the details, but we do know enough. So here we walk in. And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness, it is certainly, certainly, as we saw in Daniel chapter 12, how the unregenerate don't get it, but the church alive does. That's the mystery. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Because we know it is. We know it. The world is ignorant of this, but we're not. And the worldly in the church is ignorant of it, but we're not. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. Now, two things have to be noted here in the text. And you know what is restraining him. And then go down here. And only he who now restrains it. That is the power of this lawless one. And the rebellion that he leads. Two things. One is neuter. The other one's personal. What is it? Very quickly, in the interest of time, many, many, many views here. I think the safest is to go with those who understand this as the power, the providential power of God holding back until it is time and him personally doing so. Now, there are many ways to describe that, but in general, that's the way. It is God who is sovereign and providentially over all. And his power is that which restrains, and he is the one who decides when to release the final version of the Antichrist. Some have even said, well, let's continue the Daniel chapter 10 notion. Look at Daniel chapter 10 all the way through 12. What are the agents? Uh, who are the agents through whom? God does restraining and battle in Daniel 10 through 12. Well, it's the angelic. 
Some, some, and they may be right, I don't know, I prefer the general, but some say specifically it's probably referring to the angelic uh, powers under the authority of God, like Michael, holding back. Now, why would these interpreters say that? Very quickly, Daniel 12, at that time, verse 1, shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and other verses particularly in chapter 10, interesting combat going on in behind the scenes. So some scholars who are level-headed seem to think that maybe this God's action of, of restraining is done through the angelic realm. Other answers to this question have been insufficient by the church because of very strange views. But, but mainly we want to see this as the power of God holding back and the sovereign hand of God at the right time will release very safe. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. What do you mean already at work? We've already talked about that. 1 John 2.18, antichrists are already among us. Types, not final version. Let's go to 1 John 4, verse 3. 1 John 4, verse 3. Note the text. 1 John 4. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus, Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. The lawless one, not final version, lawless ones are loose. And we can see them and we hear of them. The lawless ones in the church proclaiming uh, versions of feminism and versions of of pro-homosexual uh, lifestyle, and also perversions of, of, of doctrine. For instance, the deity of Christ, the softening of the deity of Christ, the softening um, of, of, the, of, of the union of God, of God the Son with God the Father, the softening of doctrine. And that is of the spirit of Antichrist. So, Paul then, coming back to our text, Paul then is saying that God, through whatever agency he is so choosing, is holding back this lawless one until the right time. He is the one in charge of history. He's the one who is holding him back at the right time. He'll let him go. And then we shall know. And then, we must stand firm. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 is another passage to observe. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Paul, again, speaking to the people of God, writes this. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? And then he defines lawlessness. Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? He is saying that even the kindest elements of the lost world are still not under Christ and therefore under the authority of darkness and the dark one. So once God removes his hand, things hidden will be made manifest final sense to the church. These things are already at work. So the lawless one is rebellious, proud, and he's restrained. He is, he is being restrained by God. Those things we can say about him with clarity. And the rebellion and the revelation of this lawless one must come first before the second coming. So we know those things the early church understood these things. They did not replace the gospel with eschatology, as many evangelical churches have done. The study of the last things cannot become the gospel. It is affiliated with the gospel, but it, is, it must not be the gospel. Who is the man of lawlessness? He is one of rebellion, of pride, but he is he is now restrained. That means that when the final version is released, 
look out. And look up. What will he be like, this final version? Pick the worst type that you can think of in history and then say, using uh, lingo, he ain't seen nothing yet. So, three applications. How might we apply this? This account is not a myth. It isn't. It's true. It should not lead to fear, however. Should never lead to fear or fear mongering. We don't need to have folks wandering around the tundra uh, um, having a discussion about, uh, well, we have to think about the Bible. Uh, the Bible has to be taken literally in all areas. And now I'm going to tell you that these, these creatures in Revelation are actually stingers, helicopters. I thought we we're supposed to take the Bible literally. How come these, uh, these stinger folks are now helicopters or missiles? I don't get it because it isn't true. Take the language of Revelation for what it is, the very word of God. And language that should just, it's not talking about Gorbachev. It's talking about the contrast between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of Christ who will reign forever, and he will be victorious. There is no fear, no fear. John 6, notice, 35 through 40. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that <clears throat> you have seen me and yet, uh, <clears throat> and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast you out. <clears throat> For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up at the last day. Authentic, authentic believers cannot lose their salvation. Why? Because to do so would mean that the Father's will would have to fail. And that can't happen. Here's what the Bible says. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of it all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. So what I'm saying no matter how fierce the man of lawlessness is, if you be born again, so shall you be at the day of Christ. And that's Paul's point to the church at Thessalonica. So shall you be at the day of Christ. And so shall it should be for us. Shall it be for us. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Here's something else that should encourage us. Hebrews chapter 2. And verse 14, note the word of the Lord. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Have no fear, saints of God. The devil and the Antichrist, in a real sense, have been defeated. In the final sense, that's coming. The lake of fire is coming. But in a real sense, even now, through the cross and the empty tomb, they have been defeated. And all they, they just don't know yet, the mopping up is going to happen. It's coming. As soon as the Allies landed on D-Day, June the 6th, 1944, and got a foothold, that was the end of Nazi Germany. But it took time to get to Berlin. And so now the devil is defeated in a real sense. But he is on, he's on a leash. But it's a long enough leash to chew us up if we think that he is no trouble whatsoever. So therefore there should be no fear. We are kept as the church 
and the devil and the Antichrist in a real sense have been defeated and will be so in the final sense when Christ comes and the lake of fire, the judgment comes and they're cast into the lake of fire. Praise God for that. Secondly, elders, teach and preach well. I won't take the time to go there. 1 Timothy 4.16, the imperative upon elders. You, Justin, we must preach the gospel. And it, it preach it. Teach proper doctrine because it will save ourselves and our hearers. Teach it. Be unafraid of the culture which may call you some very terrible names. And to parents, guardians, whether you be a couple together or a single parent, teach your children. Teach them. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Teach them at every moment you have about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truths of the gospel, the true, the doctrines that so adorn the pages of this beautiful book. Teach them to your children. Church, teach the young. It is by this that the church will stand even against the final version of Antichrist. Who ever thought? One of the versions, my version of eschatology is historic premillennial, where we go through the, uh, the great tribulation. And there are some, I remember, I have good brothers in Christ who don't believe in that. But I told you this before, John MacArthur said, a good teacher, he said, well, you know, I, I believe the church will be raptured out, but even if I'm wrong, it doesn't matter. If I'm wrong and you guys over here, you other Christians are right, you're going to go through, that's fine with me. All I'm going to do is go down the day one, day one of tribulation, preach the gospel at Antichrist headquarters, and I'm out. <laughs> Good way to look at it. Unbelievers, if there be an unbeliever who is in attendance today and the Holy Spirit is saying to you now, you have no Christ. You must know that the Antichrist is the best that the world system can offer. But I tell you that the kingdom of God presents Christ as the pure Lamb of God. So then, by the power of the Holy Spirit, might you flee to Christ and avoid the final condemnation in hell which is a reality, and it's eternal. R.C. Sproul said one time in a lecture to a group of seminarians that the thing that unbelievers really have to fear in hell is God. And he's right. The wrath of God. Eternally poured out against those who will not, who rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Eternally poured out upon them. And these words... You saw on the screen, beautiful verse, John 3.16. I want to read again John 3.36. We all know it in the King James, perhaps. Perhaps many of us do. But I want to read it in the extra special version. John 3.36. Whoever believes, that is, authentically believes. This is, this is, this is trust that comes from God, whoever Believes in the Son has eternal life. That is, already now and continue into the future. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. So today the challenge is to this. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may those who have no Christ flee to Christ. May their hearts be open to believe. May they desire Christ. May they repent. Faith and repentance are gifts from God. We ask, O oh Lord, so gift today open hearts. O oh Lord God, may many flee the wrath to come. So that is it for today. Uh, seminary intern Phil, would you come?
I don't remember which psalm I left off on, so I'm going to go with 141. <clears throat> I call upon thee, O Lord, make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to thee. Let my prayer be counted as incense before thee, and lifting up my hands as an evening sacrifice. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord, keep watch over the door of my lips. Incline, my heart not, incline not my heart to any evil, but to busy myself Incline not my heart to any evil to busy myself with wicked deeds in company with men who work iniquity, and let me not eat of their dainties. Let a good man strike or rebuke me in kindness, but let the oil of the wicked never anoint my head, for my prayers continually against their wicked deeds. When they are given over to those who shall condemn them, then they shall learn that the word of the Lord is true. As a rock which one cleaves and shatters in the land, so shall their bones be strewn at the mouth of shale. But my eyes are toward thee, O Lord God, in thee I seek refuge. Leave me not defenseless. Keep me from the trap which they have laid for me, from the snares of evildoers, for the wicked together fall into their own nets while I escape. Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus, we do pray this prayer today, <clears throat> that you'd keep the word of God in our hearts and our minds and on our lips, that we would recognize evil and that we'd recognize lawlessness that we'd recognize falsehood and false teaching, that we'd recognize the idolatry that comes with the lawless one. Final version, and we pray continually, Lord, that you'd help us to recognize the wickedness and the evil and the godlessness that comes with lawlessness that is in our culture, in our society, that comes with a culture and a philosophical outlook that would deny you, that would deny your son, that would deny your Holy Spirit. That comes with an outlook that would deny that we are sinners in need of a savior. And that comes with an outlook that would deny our, that Christ came to save us from our sins by the, his shed blood. Father, keep our hearts and our minds strong and intact. Keep our hearts and our minds focused on the word of God. Keep the word of God deep within us, Lord, that we might continually pursue you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This service is ended. Mm-mm. <clears throat>